Welcome, everybody, to the very first episode of Snooze TV. My name is Jennifer Beard, and I'm one of the board members of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm going to be your host tonight. I also happen to be an assistive technology specialist with Fulton County Schools. I have a loved one who has hypersomnia, so hypersomnia is um, an issue that personally affects me. And I have a passion for teaching and learning, which is why I think this show is so important. And I also have a passion for leveraging the power of technology um, to kind of amplify uh, the power of the Hypersomnia Foundation. So I'm very excited for Snooze TV tonight, and I want to welcome all of our live audience members. And I want to encourage you all to participate in um, posting questions to our guest panel members. Tonight's show features a guest panel of parents who have children with idiopathic hypersomnia. So as the discussion is going on, please feel free to post your questions to our um, Google Plus events page on where, where you might be watching this video live, or you could feel free to post comments to our YouTube page underneath this video. And we have one of our um, guest panelists who will be monitoring those questions so that we can um, pull those into the discussion and answer those questions live. If you happen to be watching this live uh, video on our website, but you would like to participate in the chat, you could scroll all the way down to the bottom of our website, and you'll see our social media icons at the bottom. So you could click on our Google Plus or our YouTube icon at the bottom and go over to either of those pages to post your questions. So with that said, um, I just want to give a couple of tips to our audience about posting questions. So I am going to try to do a screen share here. Let's see how this works. OK. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. OK, great. So my tips for the audience when they ask their questions is to keep your questions succinct and to keep your questions kind of general. It's easier for our panelists to respond to your question if it's more of a general question rather than super specific um, to your situation. And post questions that you think would be helpful to the broader audience in general. And we'd love to hear your comments too. So if you're enjoying the show, please let us know. We'd love to, to hear those comments as well. And um, just be aware that your comment or question may appear on screen if we can figure out how to work that feature. So wish us luck on that. <laughs> OK, so let me stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to introduce our guest panel members. OK. All right, so our first guest panel member is um, Catherine Frederick or Kate Murray. And um, Michael, if you'd be kind enough to white box Kate for us, please, so we can see her in the big screen. OK, let's see what I can do here. Here we go. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Kate is the mother of five adult children and the grandmother of 10. She and her husband live in Arizona. Her youngest daughter, Isabel Genevieve or Jenny, has been sleepy from infancy. But after she had a, a head injury at 10 months, her personality changed and sleep became more of an issue. Even though Kate had access to some of the best medical minds and actually worked with sleep physicians for most of her career, it was not until 2013 that a physician's assistant actually listened to her and referred her for a sleep study, her second. We also, in our guest panel, have uh, Tom F. Thomas is a Lutheran pastor who is married to Carla, an elementary school teacher. They have one child, a son, who's diagnosed as having idiopathic hypersomnia. While they suspect their son has had IH since infancy, a diagnosis wasn't formally made until he was a freshman in high school. 
Since that diagnosis was made, they've been blessed with good care from their family physician, specialists, caseworkers, teachers, and professors. Their son is a senior in college and will be entering graduate school in the fall so as to work towards a PhD in clinical psychology. We also have guest panelist Mary King. Mary is from Boston, Massachusetts. She is the mother of a young adult who experiences idiopathic hypersomnia. She volunteers her time with the Hypersomnia Foundation. She's a counseling psychologist by training. She's an author and a consultant to faculty in higher ed. And we also have Diana Kimmel. Diana is a stay-at-home mother of two. Both Diana and her daughter have been diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia. When Diana is feeling wakeful, she volunteers her time with the Hypersomnia Foundation and facilitating a hypersomnia support group in Atlanta, Georgia. We also have somebody on the guest panel that's kind of behind the scenes. He's really here with us in spirit. His name is Michael Spa-Race, and he is the product management analyst for Home Depot. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy at Clemson University and began his career for Clemson, working for Clemson University's Master of Public Administration program. And that led to an exciting opportunity working as a CTO for an education technology startup in Virginia. After Michael met his wife, Deidre, he began looking for a position in the Atlanta area where he currently resides and works. Michael became interested in the Hypersomnia Foundation after his wife, recently diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, attended the 2014 Hypersomnia Conference. He has a background in web development, data an analysis, tech support, and distance education. And he's here tonight to um, help us with some tech support things and to kind of make sure that everything runs smoothly for us. So thank you, Michael, and thank you, guest panelists, for being here. We really, really appreciate you all. So I just want to jump in and, and kind of get started. And I thought that since we're talking about idiopathic hypersomnia and um, children having idiopathic hypersomnia, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of talk about what is idiopathic hypersomnia. So, um, Kate, I was wondering if you might be willing to chime in with a little bit of information about idiopathic hypersomnia for us? Sure. Um, an interesting thing happened this year in that um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine published their new, it's called nosology, or classification system called the International Classification of Sleep Disorders Three. And they set out criteria that must be met for a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. At the same time, the American Psychiatric Association published a document called the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. They also uh, laid out diagnostic criteria for what they call hypersomnolence disorder. So we have two big organizations um, putting out criteria that are similar, but really not the same. And um, that's led to a little bit of confusion in the whole arena of hypersomnia, hypersomnolence, as the DSM-5 calls it. So if would you like me to take a minute to review those criteria, Jen? If you don't mind. Okay, okay sure. Now, I pulled them up, so I'm going to just do a little bit of reading from these. But in order to meet the diagnostic criteria uh, for the ICSD-3, the Academy of Sleep Medicine's document, the person has to have daily periods of irrepressible need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep that occur for at least three months. You can't have cataplexy. And you have to have an MSLT, or multiple sleep latency test, sometimes called a daytime sleep test, a nap study. Um, and you use the standard techniques for that. And it has to show fewer than two sleep onset periods of REM, or rapid eye movement sleep. Um, and the, the latency, or the time it takes from when you fall asleep to you begin having REM sleep has to be less than or equal to 15 minutes. Also on the MSLT, you have to have 
it, oh, I'm sorry, on the, the, the persistence or the latency to REM sleep was actually on polysomnography at night, okay? But then also on the MSLT, the sleep latency has to be less than or equal to eight minutes. So that's one of those, one measurable instance. The other is that you can use actigraphy, which is a watch that you wear on the wrist and it monitors sleep over a long period of time. Or you can do 24-hour um, sleep study where you know you're hooked up to the whole nine yards and in the sleep lab for at least 24 hours. So you have to show that in a 24-hour period you have at least 660 minutes of sleep. Typically people have 11 to 14 hours. And on actigraphy, you typically measure that over seven days without any um, anything impairing your ability to just sleep however you want. So for example, when my daughter had it, she had a week when she didn't wasn't in college, she did it over spring break and measured how how much she slept given left to her own devices, so to speak. And then just like in the um, DSM5, you have to not have insufficient sleep. So you can't um, limit the amount of sleep that you have so that you're super, super sleepy when you go into the testing. And there isn't anything else that better explains the hypersomnia or hypersomnolence. So that's in both of these things. Um, it's not a diagnostic criteria in the ICSD-3, but sleep drunkenness, which um, is a difficulty awakening from sleep, frequently returning to sleep, irritability, confusion that lasts more than an hour, um, or typically lasts more than an hour, but maybe only for a shorter period of time, or that you have long, unrefreshing naps. So those are kind of the criteria for ICSD-3. Now we'll talk about those from the um, DSM-5. And the DSM-5 actually doesn't require testing, any, any objective testing to make a diagnosis. And one thing I'd like to point out, they use the term hypersomnolence. And their point with hypersomnolence is that it's more the effect on the daytime than what happens during the sleep period. So the, the terminology changed. They used to use the term hypersomnia, and they changed it to hypersomnolence meaning that the main symptom was excessive sleepiness, not necessarily so much that you slept a long time. So they're, they're really making a, a difference in the daytime consequences of not being able to be fully alert. So they say that you have a self-report excessive sleepiness or hypersomnolence, despite having a main sleep period of at least seven hours. Then you also have to have recurrent periods of sleep or lapses into sleep within the same day. So in essence, naps. <laughs> and that the prolonged main sleep period, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night, is at least nine hours and it's non-restorative. Or you have difficulty being fully awake after abrupt awakening, which in their notes, say that that is the same thing as sleep drunkenness or confusional arousal or you know what whatever term is used for it but it is that it's um, you know a daytime impact so the hypersomnolence according to the DSM-5 has to happen at least three times a week and has to have lasted for at least three months it has to be accompanied by significant distress or impairment in cognitive social occupational or impair, important area of functioning and just like the other is not better explained by another condition, another um, a substance, drugs of abuse or medication and or another medical condition. So those are the two criteria so as you can see they are similar but really 
One depends more on objective testing. One is more self-report. Uh, the folks at DSM-5 really place an emphasis on the daytime impact, and the Academy of Sleep Medicine looks more at what happens at night and during the, the sleep episode itself. Hope that so helps. it doesn't sound like um, both groups fully agree um, entirely with each other or that they're consistent, I guess, um, is what I'm trying to say. Are there mm -hmm. certain groups of people that use the ICD versus the DSM? The DSM has traditionally been used by psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, what they're trying to do is make the, the new DSM-5 attempted to be uh, more usable by primary care physicians. Um, and so that may be one of the reasons why they didn't put so much emphasis on the objective testing. And again, the sleep folks are the ones who do the objective testing. So they would be more likely, you know, to use that type of a criteria. The big thing on the DS, on the, um, the ICSD is that this time in their revision, they added the thing about um, wrist actigraphy being acceptable, and they included the 660 minutes or 11 hours of sleep. They'd never had that before. It used to be that you had to have, you know, polysomnography and, a, you know, a formal sleep study, and now it can be based on actigraphy. The one thing is, Currently, most insurance companies and Medicare do not reimburse, and Medicaid do not reimburse for actigraphy. So even though it's been proven to be a good and objective measure, and I think a lot of people um, in their diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia have um, undergone actigraphy, currently it's not reimbursed, so um, a lot of physicians don't prescribe it. Okay, thank you so much. That that's a lot of a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's kind of good to start off with sort of a, a definition of what the medical profession says that we're here talking about today. And so I know that our guest panel, you're all parents, you all have children um, with idiopathic hypersomnia. So I kind of wanted to open it up to the guest panel now and just give you an opportunity to talk about your kids a little bit. Um, maybe you could just kind of introduce us to your children and um, tell them, you know, kind of how old are they, uh, what are their interests, what makes them wonderful, you know, what are they like today, and then we'll kind of go back into time and talk about um, sort of their progression and, and what you noticed as parents over time. So um, does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Should I just pick somebody? I think Diana just popped up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's you, Kate. Okay, I'll start first. Um, my daughter is Eden. She is uh, now 21 years old. Uh, she was diagnosed two and a half years ago um, at Emory. I think my story might be a little different than um, the other panelists here where I was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia first. Um, when I was going through it, the diagnosis myself. I didn't really, I, I didn't really see the symptoms that I can think about now. Um, you know, I just thought she was a normal sleepy teenager. I thought she just was, you know, the brain fog was just normal teenage um, personalities. Um, when I did get my diagnosis, um, as many of you know, idiopathic hypersomnia is not very accepted, and um, people really weren't believing my diagnosis. I was depressed, I was tired, I was lazy. Um, so I, I faced the challenge of um, having others accept her diagnosis as well. I can tell you that when she was diagnosed, um, it really changed a lot. Uh, her personality became brighter, her affect became brighter. Um, it was just a different child. No more sleepiness, no more frustration, no more agitation. Uh, confusion, her cognitive uh, abilities improved all around. When she was diagnosed or when she started her treatment? 
Well, technically, when she started her treatment, um, you know, I guess she kind of got fast tracked because of my diagnosis and being, um, you know, seeing a doctor that was helping me. She, I, her diagnosis came very quickly, um, so she uh, was she was very lucky as far as uh, a quick diagnosis and then a medicine regimen that helped her. Thank you, Mary. Do you want to tell us a little bit about about your son? Um, you're muted, Mary, so if you want to unmute your um, microphone. Thank you. Yes, our son Patrick is 23 years old now. Um, what idiopathic hypersomnia looks like in his life is long sleeps. Uh, 10 hours is not that long compared to 15 hours, so we're happy at 10 hours. Um, chronic exhaustion during the day. Um, Certainly fogginess upon waking in the morning. Um, it affects his short-term memory sometimes. And you can see him coming out of it uh, when he becomes much more focused. And that might take a little while. Um, and his sleep is not refreshing. So the diagnoses from the three sources that Kate described, um, that's what it trans those, they, they translate into in our family. Um, who Patrick is today is really a different young man than who he was um, before he became so affected. So who he was uh, was an all-star athlete. Uh, his sports were um, skiing and ultimate and uh, ultimate frisbee. Um, he was on ski patrol. He was a soccer referee. He was playing a number of sports uh, at his high school. He's also an EMT by training and certified here in Massachusetts. Um, over the past four years, um, he has experienced uh, an increase, a debilitating increase in uh, the chronic exhaustion. And as a result, he's not spending a lot of time with sports right now because he's too exhausted to. Um, however, um, you asked what makes him wonderful, um, and that's something that has not been compromised by uh, idiopathic hypersomnia. He is still the kind, generous, genuine uh, young man that he is. He's one of the most unassuming young people that I've met. Um, he has an enormous heart. Uh, he's very gracious. He's very giving. Uh, he has indomitable spirit. And he's very, very gifted working with children and working with animals. Right now, he has a part-time job as a personal care attendant uh, working with two autistic children. Um, and they are at extremes on the autis autism spectrum. Um, and his comment to me was, I shouldn't even be paid for this. It doesn't feel like work. Um, this just comes so natural. He doesn't understand it as a gift. Um, so Patrick currently is taking flamazinol and we are working with him to find a dose that um, affects the length of sleep as well as um, his vigilance during the day and his ability to focus and we've made some progress in that regard. Thanks Mary. You know I um, thank you Michael I, I wanted to kind of ask what makes your children wonderful first to start off because I think so often we kind of get stuck in that mindset of idiopathic hypersomnia is defining who we are and who, who our children are. And I, I kind of want to remind um, the community and everybody out there that it doesn't have to define who we are. And right. we're still wonderful people. So I, I appreciate you sharing that about your son. Um, so Thomas, do you want to unmute your mic and um, tell us a little bit about your, your child? Yes, I would love to. My son Christopher is a 21-year-old senior in uh, college and um, he, he has had, we believe at least, uh, idiopathic hypersomnia since infancy. It's, we can't really remember when uh, he didn't struggle with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. His uh, sleep I guess the best way to describe his sleep habits are, as he says to me, if he wanted to sleep 12 to 14 hours every night, he could. But in his case, he doesn't have to. He may get seven hours of sleep a night and function in the same fashion as he would if he got 
12. Um, so we noticed early on that he slept a lot during the day. Uh, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and um, we noticed he would sleep at uh, inappropriate, socially inappropriate times, such as uh, every single time I preached. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of pressure to not do that in a Lutheran pastor's household, I might add. Uh, incentive. And so um, being ignorant as to, you know, not knowing that he had a problem, but then, you know, obviously as time went on, we began to understand that something wasn't uh, something wasn't right here. But he didn't really have a formal diagnosis until he was a freshman in high school. So that's a long period of time mm -hmm. that he had to live with this and uh, wonder why he was different and why he slept and didn't have the energy in some cases. I can remember uh, him doing some running. Um, when he was younger, in his early teens, in PE class, and he couldn't keep up. And after we got the diagnosis, the physician said, "Well, of course he couldn't. He was exhausted, you know." So um, I, I must say, uh, in retrospect, um, it, it's frustrating to have had him live so long without any understanding of what was what was occurring to him, and and uh, and without us being as sympathetic and helpful as we could have been but I'm thankful we had a very good physician who uh, right off the bat sent us to uh, Mayo Clinic which isn't too far away from here um, and we had the, the requisite sleep test done and, and a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia as a freshman in high school um, he uh, was originally at first he was treated for a variety of things along with that that didn't make much of a difference. Uh, the main treatment was at uh, first uh, Provigil, which didn't do a whole lot of good for him. A few years later, we got him on Ritalin, pretty high dose of Ritalin, that helped a, a great deal, and that's what he's been on until recently. He just started trialing uh, clarithromycin, so we found that even at the initial dosage very helpful for him. All that said. Uh, none of that has masked the kind of person he is. I'm very, very proud of him. He's uh, never been a difficult uh, son, even through his teenage years. Uh, I thought I'd get payback, but uh, fortunately I didn't. Um, yeah, very, very bright, very gifted, I guess I should say, intellectually uh, curious, uh, great sense of humor. Um, just uh, very compassionate as well and very, very kind-hearted has been since he was just very, very young. And so uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of him, as you can tell, and he is a joy to have as a son. Uh, and I'm very thankful that we're able to find some uh, better treatments for him, that we learned how to uh, help him manage it as well. And uh, boy, um, things like... Uh, this program and other resources on the internet have been absolutely instrumental. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Kate, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, Jenny? Sure. Um, as mentioned, she's the youngest of five and began sleeping 16 hours at a stretch when she was five weeks old, which you know, if she were my first child, it would have been wonderful, but I had to wake her up, pack her in the car, and haul her around Minnesota <laughs> sound asleep half the time. Um, she was diagnosed with ADHD when she was a, a five-year-old. She was in kindergarten. And I remember thinking if we could just let her sleep as much as she could sleep, of course she wouldn't have ADHD because she could be awake during this, you know, she would be more alert. But that didn't happen, and so she went through a variety of things th through all of her childhood, and in adolescence became even sleepier. And getting her up in the morning to go to school was close to impossible. I remember, you know, three or four times every morning having to wake her up, literally pull her out of bed, you know, sprinkle water in her face, do anything to wake her up. She'd come downstairs for breakfast and say, oh, Mom, I'm sorry, I forgot my notebook upstairs. And she'd go up and she was back in bed, so asleep. I was just beside myself and couldn't get anyone to listen. Her physician, um, you know, I said, she's just so sleepy. And, of course, no one, they put um, 
oximetry on her and said, well, she doesn't appear to have sleep apnea, but, you know, I said, I know she doesn't have sleep apnea. I worked at the Academy of Sleep Medicine for years and years. I, I know, as I said, you know, I did have access to a lot of sleep people, and no one ever said anything about idiopathic hypersomnia. So then um, when she was in college, she had surgery after her freshman year of college, and she slept for the next year, literally. I mean, her longest sleep time was 84 hours. Um, I believe she got up to go to the bathroom, but she didn't eat or do anything else. She also has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, so that was um, makes it a little more difficult because she has a lot of pain with it as well. Um, but uh, finally, she saw a, a new nurse or a a physician's assistant and I went with her to the appointment when she was 23 and I said have your list of the three things that are the most difficult for you and she told him sleep is my number one so she finally got sent for a real sleep study and MSLT and everything and was diagnosed and about two weeks later I got a call from David Rye who I'd worked with when I was at the Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation who said Kate can you help us with the we, you know, the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I said, how did you know? <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? I said, how did you know my daughter was just diagnosed with hypersomnia? And he said, I had no idea. And so, there we go. My daughter was elected to the state senate at ASU last year. She is a, well, I think we're on about the seventh year senior. <laughs> she's 25, and we're hoping that she's classified as a senior now. But she's wonderful. I think there must be something about having hypersomnia and being a loving, caring, compassionate animal lover. Uh, she was a caregiver for a man with ALS. I mean, she's just, she's an amazing person. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, so it looks like we have a question from a member of our audience. And Michael, if you would um, share my screen, I think I've tried to pull the question up. This is Rachel's question. And she is asking, here, let me try to share my screen. Yeah, we can all see it. I think. Mm -hmm. See that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Do you know of anyone who has REM more than twice in the MSLT, like in narcolepsy, that has hypersomnia symptoms as well? Thank you, Rachel, for your question. Um, does anybody, anybody want to comment on that? No. I do not know of anybody that has um, REM more than twice uh, or twice in an MSLT myself. Yeah, I think by the diagnostic criteria, that would be a diagnosis of narcolepsy. That, um, uh, as it's now called in the um, ICSD-3, a type 2 narcolepsy, because you can have symptoms of daytime sleepiness with narcolepsy that's not, um, you know, uh, inconclusive. It is, but if you have more than two REM periods on MSLT in one nap, it's not just on any nap. No, I think it's among the five naps that you have at least two REM onset periods. Thank you, Rachel, for your question. We're not physicians, so we're doing our best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mary, you might have something on that. Do you? I don't. Uh, I have. I can't comment on it at all. All right. Um, so let's go on. I just wanted to ask you. You know, in hindsight, was there a particular moment in time that you can remember thinking as a parent, something is really, really wrong here and I, I really need to get my child some help? So I just wanted to, to open that up to the panel. I can offer something there. Um, this was when our son was in high school um, and I thought he was a very, very deep sleeper. Too deep. Um, and I was thinking ahead to his days at the university um, and how he's, he was going to wake up um, if he needed to, such as a fire in the dorm or something like that. And um, there was no one that I could speak to about that. The pediatrician 
uh, didn't want to hear about it. Neither of the pedi he had actually three pediatricians due to attrition by age, and nobody wanted to hear about it. Um, I spoke with a pediatric anesthesiologist who also uh, was head of acupuncture at a hospital here in Boston about it. He was intrigued by the question, but he couldn't offer me any help. Um, my fear was uh, how was I going to ensure that my son was safe when he was living, uh, wasn't living at home. Um, so the very deep sleep was a trigger as I look back that um, he carried that with him until recently. We're seeing some effects from the flamazenol where he's not sleeping as deeply, which is very, very relieving. Um, so I'd offer, offer that to other parents. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else have um, anything that they'd like to chime in on? Um, any signs or symptoms that you think might be helpful for parents out there to hear if they're scratching their heads wondering if their child might have idiopathic hypersomnia? I think for me, um, my daughter Eden just started to wake up and after an hour she would still have that blank stare on her face almost like she was sleeping and looking at me. Um, you know, no matter how much sleep she had. She wasn't a sleepy um, toddler or early childhood child. Um, it just seemed to start one day. Looking back now, we're associating it with a head injury. But there was definitely like something like she was she was functioning and sleeping. She was functioning and almost like she was drugged. Um, and that was what really set me off. That I, I knew something was wrong and she needed um, some assistance. So just as um, a quick anecdotal poll, how many of your children had have, have had some type of head injury or, or TBI, traumatic brain injury? Me. So that's Kate, and Diana's raising her hand. Um, Tom or Mary? No. no. Okay, so so anecdotally, in our non-scientific poll... <laughs> 50%. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to, to ask that. Um, Could I touch on something, Jen, that Mary brought up? Please, Kate. Okay, um, it's that transition to independent living that was the scariest thing in the world for me. Mm -hmm. And we actually sent Jenny to a boarding school for her senior year of high school with the idea that perhaps she could transition better. Maybe she was too dependent on me. I was so afraid that she, that it was maybe a, I don't know, dysfunctional relationship between us that she just wasn't waking up. And so I said, so she went, you know, willingly to a boarding school and the proctor would get her up in the morning with great deal of difficulty. I mean, they really had the same struggles that we had and have, you know, in many mornings she would say, oh, I have a migraine, I can't go to school. And an hour later, of course she didn't have a migraine, but she would say that in her sleep. And, um, so at one point when she went to college, she had a dorm, an apartment with a roommate, and basically lived at home because we kept trying to find the best environment for her to be able to live independently. So that's been a real struggle. Um, Kate, we found that our son was at a university for four years, and that was part of his need for independence and part of mm -hmm. our commitment to giving him independence. Right. Um, he wanted to live off campus and that turned out to be the best thing for him because mm -hmm. he was in a house with friends. The friends were willing to wake him up when he needed to mm -hmm. wake for morning classes. Even 11 o'clock classes presented a problem. Mm -hmm. In the dorm it was not that kind of an arrangement. Oftentimes right. you have a dorm mate who's not a friend. Right, and, exactly. Uh, or doesn't speak English at all <laughs> as, as one of his dorm mates, which made life a little bit complicated. Um, so um, we were very supportive of him living with his friends in housing off campus because they as a group made sure that um, he would stay on target in terms of getting up when he needed to get up. Boy, that's 
a good group of friends. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In terms of recognizing, am I, unless, I hope I'm not interrupting no, no. a stream of thought here. Okay, sorry. In terms of recognizing uh, that something was wrong or different, my, my experience is a little bit different because it would appear that our son Christopher had this all along. And so it uh, was something that was, we didn't have anything else to compare it to, really. And so it was something that was a gradual realization. I think it had more to do with my own kind of denial than, than anything, uh, where we'd have little you know symptoms here and there. We would pass it off as uh, you know the usual, um, you know, just being a kid or he's lazy today or didn't get enough sleep. Maybe he's just in a habit of going to sleep, and he, you know, all kinds of things we would, you know, excuses we would make for it, and it really had to reach kind of a critical mass. Of of uh, symptoms where you knew the benefits of sleeping for him so outweighed um, of not sleeping. I'm sorry, so outweighed the benefits of sleeping that we realized, wait a second, something's wrong. So, for example, in school, uh, he would not only fall asleep during lectures, but I recall that he fell asleep one time. They had papers to pass uh, from the front of the row all the way back and as he was turning to to hand papers back to his classmate he fell asleep I mean so so that those kinds of things were so unusual you realized you know we've got to get him into a physician and and so it was probably more about me and and, and his mother than him because it was something that was gradual and kind of the scales kind of we had to have enough data I guess um, you know before we realized what have we been doing we need to get him to a physician and get him some help so so what I'm curious to know since we're kind of on that subject of, of physicians what what type of physician did you all seek out um, initially to bring your child to when you first realized that this this was an issue and it needed to really be looked into We took okay, him I'll, to I'll our. Give it a shot here. Okay, Mary, and then Tom. Okay, so um, our situation is a little bit different than what I'm hearing from other folks on the panel. Um, we didn't see these signs since infancy. As a matter of fact, our son was uh, expelled from daycare because he wouldn't sleep during the day and he refused to take naps. So um, when he would sleep at night, a good 12 hours, which of course let mom sleep, then I didn't know that that might be problematic. Um, it was our son who came to us and said to us after his first year away at the university that he thought he had a problem. And I asked him what made him think he had a problem. He said because he was living as his friends were living, doing what they were doing. Um, doing nothing differently than they were doing, but they were able to get up at 6 or 7 in the morning. They were able to work out, and he was still sleeping at 1 o'clock and not able to function when he got out of bed at 1, feeling exhausted. So when he told me that, um, I contacted Children's Hospital in Boston because he had been a patient at Children's Hospital, and they take their patients into adulthood. Um, but when it comes to sleep, problems, they don't take the uh, adult um, child any longer unless it was for a sleep problem originally. So they referred us to two major hospitals in Boston, each of which had waiting lists anywhere between 8 and 12 weeks. So the first set of doctors we dealt with at the sleep clinic happened to be pulmonologists, but they didn't disclose that. Um, so lesson number one, if I were to do it again, I would want their credentials up front because given our son's earlier diagnosis of ADD, which was really questionable because he didn't meet all the criteria, however, um, he met enough criteria to warrant uh, stimulant medication, which helped somewhat. Um, he, he met with a team of pulmonologists for quite some time and we were spinning our wheels because nothing was coming of those meetings. Uh, we then met with a neurologist 
I'd like to say that was better, but in fact that was worse. We then went on to another a medical facility, another 12 week, week wait, and he met with another neurologist there. Both of these neurologists were head of the clinics. All the doctors were giving us conflicting diagnoses. Um, they were using different approaches to evaluating his situation. Uh, one of the things that you know, we were asked to think about was the testing that our child has had. I won't go through the litany of tests. They were all, all the tests were done, including an MRI and an, uh, a tigraphy. Um, and um, it was there that we had a diagnosis of narcolepsy. Um, and I questioned the diagnosis, but I realized that my son was very relieved, as one of the panelists said. Very, I think Diana did. Her daughter was very relieved. Um, to get a diagnosis that helped, um, in our instance, our son make sense of what he was living with. Um, but that diagnosis did not prove to be um, a most accurate diagnosis, and none of the treatments uh, for narcolepsy that he, he was given were effective. So we had seen pulmonologists, we had seen neurologists, um, the primary care physicians, which I think have a critical role to play, uh, we did not have support from that, that particular uh, doctor or doctors because our son was in transition from uh, having a pediatrician to having his own primary care physician. Neither one really gave any credibility to his concerns about his chronic exhaustion and his long sleeping and always waking up tired. Um, and so um, I think one piece of advice I'd have for parents is to get a very good uh, primary care physician who will respect what the parents are saying, respect what the child is saying, um, because kids don't make these things up. Mm -hmm. uh, they're experiencing them, they know their lives aren't normal, and they really need a primary care physician they can um, feel supported by and will guide the parents to the right sleep doctors for further evaluation. Thanks, Mary. Tom, do you want to chime in? I sure do. I want to build on what you said about a primary care physician. Our uh, family physician is uh, wonderful, and our experience bears out what, uh, what she just said, how important that is. We took our son to her after we kind of reached the critical mass, realizing something was awry. And um, she immediately, after hearing the symptoms, said, you know, that there's, a, there's something that we need to look into here. She didn't know what it was, of course. Few people did seven years ago, probably is unfortunately still the case. I remember her explaining to me, she said, Tom, try, go home, try to take three naps in the same day. If you can do that, you have problems, you know. So uh, that... And I did. I tried that. I couldn't do it as much as I love sleep. Um, and, and that really was helpful for me to realize, oh, wow, this is something that needs to be looked into. And she, she immediately referred us to a uh, sleep specialist at Mayo Clinic and went through the overnight sleep study and the other studies that have been mentioned and didn't even finish all the studies and already said it's clear he has what we call idiopathic hypersomnia. Yeah. So that would have never happened if we would not have had a wonderful family physician, so I'm building on, on what, uh, what, what Mary said. Thank you for that. Nice. Okay, so we have a um, comment from one of our audience members, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. We appreciate you participating mm -hmm. in, our, uh, in our Hangout on Air. So Rachel says, this information is very helpful. It sounds like I'm hearing about my daughter all but her multiple REM periods. Uh, narcolepsy diagnosis but may need another evaluation. I mean, Rachel, I think that um, Mary kind of had a similar experience to mm -hmm. you, um, having her son misdiagnosed initially and then diagnosed uh, correctly. So thank you for your comments. Keep them coming, audience members. We will definitely um, pull your questions on air and, and answer them live. And uh, we, we'd love to have you. The way that you do that is by going to our YouTube uh, page and commenting underneath this live broadcast or going to our Google Plus page and commenting underneath the live broadcast on that page. Um, so 
Let's see. Let's talk about strategies you guys have used to wake up your children. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll second that. It might be um, it might be perceived as cruel and unusual. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I I just keep thinking back on things. Our daughters used to drive 45 minutes to school when we moved to Florida, and of course Jenny would fall asleep on the way to school. And her poor sisters, what they went through to try to wake her up and literally drag her out of the car to get her into school. And that was after we'd already gone through the whole thing at home to get her up and out the door. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I think I, I won't share all the techniques because uh, <laughs> he might be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we did encourage is that he showered the night before because there was nothing worse than finding him sound asleep in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, after he woke up and went into his shower and you know he's not coming out and it's 20 minutes later and he's a sound asleep in there mm -hmm. so um, it was easier on all of us to shower the night before and then just deal with the wake up problem in the morning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and driving him to school every day mm -hmm. the senior year especially that's when it became difficult mm -hmm. and and Jen, you had asked about uh, another sign, and, and there's another sign that we had, and we didn't know what to do with it. Um, our son had made the all-star all for the ultimate player for his regional high school, and he had an opportunity to go to an all-star ultimate camp that summer. His comment to me in retrospect was very on target, but I didn't quite understand why he said it. When I asked him, I said, Show, do you want to go to that camp or do you want to go to the, you know, the regular ultimate camp here in Amherst? He said, Mom, I'll be much too tired if I go to the all-star camp. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, in retrospect, you know, that's a healthy 18-year-old kid. There's no reason he would be much too tired. He plays the game eight hours a day. Um, obviously, something else had already set in in his life, and he was experiencing it, but he wouldn't tell us about it until a year later. I think um, I think they do. Kids are kids know, um, and they see what their friends are doing, and they they see what the social lives are are going around them, and they can't keep up with that. I mean, my mm -hmm. daughter said right. to me one day, I, "I just can't, I can't be a normal teenager," um, and that was before her diagnosis and before we really knew there was something wrong. She just made comments of, "I would just rather sleep than go to a football game, or I'd rather mm -hmm. sleep than go here." Um, or it would come time to go and she, she was just happy sitting on the couch watching TV all day and having that comfort of sleeping if she needed to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, hearing, hearing a 17-year-old uh, kid say, I don't want to go out at night, it just takes up too much energy, I'm tired, mm -hmm. is, it, it's, right. it's a little bit of a light bulb moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're muted, Jen. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> I'm glad the first technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> At least to our IT person. <laughs> so I, was, um, I was asking when I was muted if any of you guys found that you needed to request accommodations for your kids when they were in high school. Did you, did you have to go through any kind of 504 IEP process? To request special accommodations for your children at all? Um, for me, uh, Eden was diagnosed with ADHD, so mm -hmm. I was getting accommodations for ADHD um, that, in hindsight, was helping more of her sleepiness, brain fog, cognitive function, or dysfunction, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Same here. And so I, I think it's Same. common to hear the ADHD. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't know I was getting accommodations for hypersomnia, but I, I looking back, I was. How many of us have have our children been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD? Oh, another anecdotal poll. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you too, Mary. Yes, yes, ADD. Yeah, but in hindsight, it's because they're sleepy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. Also, a, also a litany of of learning disabilities that certainly. Um, 
the symptoms of which are, uh, you know, suggest that they're not focused or they can't mm -hmm. organize, right? Or they're just not fully conscious right. and awake to yep. be able to do the normal kind of learning that mm -hmm. kids who aren't so affected are able to do. I Tom? often heard processing difficulties and yes. things like that. Yeah, nonverbal learning disability. Mm -hmm. Can't can't organize and process and do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom, what about you? Did your son? Well, in high school, it was. We didn't need to do too much. Mostly, it was the case of the teachers being aware mm -hmm. that if he would nap, fall asleep in class, they would not dock him. Uh, they would. They were very eager to work with us. Maybe they would have him sit in the front, and they may go over and touch him or something to, to. Uh, or if he had to get up, uh, maybe to keep himself awake, um, stand up and go use the restroom or what have you. Just something to keep him awake. Little things like that um, helped. But but there was nothing uh, outside of of that that we really had to do then. A little bit more in college, we we. Uh, uh, at least initially had had to use things like smart smart pens and things like mm -hmm. that to, to help mm -hmm. uh, uh, note taking and so forth. So just to um, clarify what the difference is between a 504 and an IEP, um, a 504 is really a document and these are by the way United States um, federal laws. So if you're in another country watching us, this may not apply to your school system, but the public school systems here in the United States, um, this is kind of where we're talking about 504 and IEPs. So 504 is a document that confirms the diagnosis of a medical condition that's interfering with academic progress. And it can be permanent or it can be temporary. Um, and, you know, it could be because of just for examples, um, hypersomnia, brain injury, ADD, um, concussion, diabetes, things like that. And the 504, the document, what it does is it guarantees accommodations uh, but not modifications to the curriculum. Whereas an IEP is an individualized education plan and it's a more restrictive document that guarantees accommodations and or modifications to the actual curriculum. The IEP confirms eligibility for special education services for your child um, through psychological testing and screening to identify learning disabilities, autism, cognitive processing, or deficits, um, or disorders, just to name a few. And primary eligibilities could theoretically exist in both a 504 and in an IEP. Um, an IEP requires a special education teacher be involved uh, with serving the needs of the student, whereas a 504 does not. So hopefully that helps to kind of clarify things. You can, um, students can get 504 accommodations in college, by the way, um, but the student or the parent has to go through the Student Disability Services Office of the college that the student enrolls in for attendance, and then they proceed from there. So the high school 504 chair or the counselor at the high school doesn't really do anything during this process, but they typically will advise the parent that they need to reach out to the college's disability office. So hopefully that some of that information is helpful. And I see that we have another comment here from Donna, so I'm going to bring this one up on screen. Um, my son's IDH came after mm -hmm. his second active case and he continues to have positive active EBV infection. Oh goodness. Has anyone else had a viral infection as the start? Has anyone had a concurrent diagnosis that diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome? Mm -hmm. Idiopathic hypersomnia is managed in terms of him being awake in the day but he is unable to attend school or work because of the symptoms of the chronic fatigue. Thank you Donna for your question. We appreciate that. Um, did anybody else have a viral infection as the start of their um, child's IH that you know of? Um, according to the DSM-5 classification, um, they can't. There is a separate category for hypersomnia caused by an infection. 
So that would be, it wouldn't really be idiopathic hypersomnia. It would be still hypersomnia, but it has a cause. So idiopathic by definition means there's no cause. I had no, I had no, um, any, any infections in Eden's life? No. So um, we actually, believe it or not, it's almost time for the show to end. But before we do, I was hoping that we could end on, on the note of providing a tip. So if we were going to sit here together in a group and kind of write up a brochure of five tips for parents, is there a tip that you might be able to provide or something that you wish you could go back in time and tell yourself at the beginning of your journey that you would have found helpful as a parent? Maybe it's um, something to help take care of yourself or your stress or some type of coping skill for yourself personally or maybe it has something to do with your child. So I just thought we might want to wrap up on, on um, offering some tips for our parents out there. I, I For me, um, advocate for your child. Um, go that ex listen to them, hear what they're saying, and uh, find the right doctor. Find the person that's going to listen to you. Um, advocate for them in school. Do everything you can. I would say um, I'll, uh, I have a whole list of things I'd like to say about that. But but one thing I would say that maybe maybe won't be brought up is how important and actually uh, helpful it was to um, go to the state rehabilita rehabilitative services. This is a recognized disability and to have the power of the state, not that people were uncooperative with us, but just how heartening it was to have someone sit across from me who has power to help, to say we're going to be with your son through school all the way into his career path uh, and do everything we can to make help him make it successful and uh, they certainly followed up with that they also provide some financial aid sometimes uh, and so boy I uh, I remember I, I wept when uh, we were assigned a caseworker for him who said this to us uh, having that kind of uh, tangible uh, uh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, uh, uh, power uh, to help was very important. I'll go back to the importance of the uh, pediatrician or primary care doctor. And if, if the pediatrician or primary care doctor uh, discredits what the child is saying or the parent's concerns, I, I think that's, that warrants finding a different pediatrician or primary care doctor. Mm -hmm because I think that their role is so very, very important. Um, in our case, it was up to the neurologists that were involved to decide what the blood work would be and things like that, that normally a primary care physician should be taking charge of. Okay. To me, the biggest thing is the power in numbers of knowing that there are other parents who have gone through exactly what I've gone through, that this is not a behavioral issue, that this is not something between my daughter and me, that um, that it is, you know, a medical condition that she no more can help than she, you know, wishes that she didn't have it. You know, she, it's certainly not something that I would wish on anyone, and at the same time understand that um, that it's as difficult on her as it is for the person trying to get her out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I think on that note, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. I just want to say thank you so much to our guest panel members for being here with us today and sharing such um, personal stories with everybody out there. I can't express to you guys enough how much you're going to be impacting other parents and, and other children's lives out there. Um, and even if we just touch one person, I think it was worth it, but I, I anticipate that we'll be um, impacting many more lives than that. So thank you very much for being here, and I'd like to thank our audience for participating with us and um, typing in your questions. We appreciate that, and I want to invite you all to come back and watch the next episode of Snooze TV, which will be on Friday, February 13th um, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topic of our next show, we're going to have a guest panel of 
people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So we're going to kind of continue the idiopathic hypersomnia theme for one more month. Again, that's Friday, February 13th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, I just want to say to everybody out there, we're not going to take it lying down, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thanks so much.